record. Recording is now on. Stragglers from the waiting room. Hey, thank you all. And welcome again to Odd Sex 35. Daniela Berman is giving a talk, Aesthetics in Times of Turmoil, the Visual Languages of the French Revolution. And it is my absolute pleasure to turn the introductory duties over to my fellow Odd Sex collectivist, Bethany Qualls. You may remember her from such amazing Odd Sex talks as Sally Salisbury from Sex Worker to Coffin Robbery, a case study in 18th century fame. Bethany, over to you. Remember, subscribe now to our YouTube channel. Uh, it is my very great pleasure to see all of you here in this room full of squares uh, or rectangles, I guess, technically. And welcome again to Odd Sex 35, Aesthetics in Times of Turmoil, the Visual Languages of the French Revolution with Dr. Daniela Berman. I'm delighted for Daniela to share her work with us today. We met virtually in summer of 2020 as part of the Afrobed Online's writing boot camp. And I remembered reaching back into the deep, deep recesses of my mind where I studied French art history, uh, which were again, many, many moons ago, to better understand exactly what she was up to. The Write with Afra initiative continues to this day, and I have been lucky to get a behind the scenes take on Daniela's compelling work on 18th and 19th century European art, particularly as connected with the French Revolution. If you ever get to walk around a museum with her, I urge you, do so. You will learn more about artistic process and products that seems humanly possible, even if it's only for an hour or two. Daniela's work as an art historian and curator spans media forms from drawings to oils, artists from the well-known to the obscure, and time from the 18th century to today. In fact, much of her research delves into complex questions of what exactly makes up time and history and change. You know, small stuff. For example, she carefully examines how artists themselves navigate the turmoil of the French Revolution, a period that, as she will talk about today, was very conscious of its historicity, as well as the need for new forms to embody a new nation. Daniela completed her PhD at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts. Still in New York City, she currently wears mini hats, including head of special projects and strategic initiatives for the Drawing Foundation, consultant for the French Embassy, art history instructor at Stern College for Women, vice president of the Historians of 18th Century Art and Architecture, and an at-large board member for the Association of Historians of 19th Century Art. She is also a writer of essays, articles, and exhibition catalog materials too numerous to detail here. She's contributed to exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, including on Jacques-Louis David, who will show up in her talk today, I'm pretty sure, and the Chateau de Versailles. She co-edited the collection Duke House and the Making of Modern New York, published by Brill in 2022, and is currently at work on a range of projects from a forthcoming essay on the unfinished stories of Joseph Barra's death to technical analysis of French and British painting, fin painting finishes. Can't say that five times. Uh, and given that so much of Daniela's research can fin considers unfinishedness, I'm gonna leave it there. I am so pleased to cede the floor for her talk today Aesthetics in Times of Turmoil, the Visual Languages of the French Revolution. Thank you so much, Bethany, for that really kind introduction. And thank you to Elaine and Noosh and everyone here at Odd Sex uh, for the invitation to speak and for all of the behind the scenes um, uh, aspect that I know about and that I don't know about. Um, I will start sharing my screen and just let me know if that looks good. Yeah, great. Wonderful. So. And can you ever, could someone who's not muted mute, please? I hear echo on the call. That's not Daniela. Great, thanks. Thanks. So in 2022, after a long period of dilapidation, the Royal Tennis Courts at the Chateau of Versailles was restored. The 1.8 million euro project was financed by a donation drive among present and former French deputies and allowed the chateau to do both structural and cosmetic interventions to the space and to restore the monumental painting by Luc Olivier Merson, dating to 1883, the moment when the Royal Tennis Court was transformed in, and the entire chateau was transformed into the Museum of the French Revolution. 
under Napoleon, and until that date, the jeu de pomme, the space, served alternately as a storage space or studio uh, for artists working on large-scale national commissions. Merson's painting might be familiar to some of you. It, along with a rarely seen, often, uh, often reproduced, unattributed 19th century oil sketch in the collection of the Musée Carnavalet, illustrates the French history textbooks about the 1789 foundational event of the French Revolution, wherein the deputies of the Third Estate vowed to remain in assembly until a constitution had been drafted. They both take their model as a high, from a highly finished drawing by the neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David, but David's intervention was never completed. Aside from being a thorn in my side throughout my research on unfinished paintings of the French Revolution, as so many people from colleagues to my landlady to my then preteen French goddaughter assured me with different levels of sass that David did indeed finish the oath of the tennis court. They had seen it illustrated after all. These slippages between later reprisals of David's composition and abandoned, David's abandoned project of the revolutionary era obscure the nuances and complexities of art making during the turbulent years between 1789 and 1799. By presenting crafted narratives, art served and serves still to codify collective memory and to not just represent, but to create history. Sorry. Uh, writing in 1798, uh, Pierre-Jean-Baptiste Chaussard noted of the revolution, this history does not belong to the pen, but to the brush, to the chisel, to the burin. The visual arts were paramount for the project of writing or rewriting history, then as now. An artwork's implication often, uh, artwork's implications often change in new social political contexts, but that problem is distinct if, if related from the task of representing an episode while that event is still unfolding. These issues were heightened for artists who had been trained by the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture in the grand genre of history painting, where artists were taught to focus on the moment of enduring didactic implication from the biblical, mythological, and antique subjects they depicted. In a letter to the president of the National Assembly, David declared, quote, we artists will no longer be forced to search the history of ancient peoples for subjects with which to exercise our brushes. Previously, there were insufficient subjects for artists, forcing them to repeat themselves. But now there is a lack of artists for all of the worthy subjects. But how could one extract an enduring narrative from an event when its implications were still unfolding? In elevating contemporary events to the historic and heroic status of history painting, artists had to adapt their subjects and approaches in various ways. The larger project seeks to highlight the range of quote unquote dialects that French artists explored in their search for a visual language for the French Revolution. Today, I'd like to offer some framework on the issue of time and temporality during the French Revolution before turning to two examples that showcase the challenges facing artists trying to make history with a capital H out of their own lived experience. A pocket watch with four dials puts on display the very real problematics of translating old time into new time. At left, a barefooted weeping woman is weighed down by chains of bondage that also support a dial bearing the traditional names of the months and the days of the week. That is to say the Gregorian calendar. She is contrasted with a young bare-breasted female allegory of liberty, a proto-Marianne dressed in blue, red, and white, holding a pike with a red Phrygian cap on it, atop a serpent-like creature whose many heads wear a bishop's mitre and a crown. She rests her left arm on a dial, indicating the months and days according to the new Republican calendar implemented during the French Revolution to, secular, to secularize timekeeping and bring the new era of France into closer alignment with nature. The new names, based on Latin and Greek terms, made allusions to the seasons and to the agricultural year. But this project did not merely 
seek to replace names to move away from the old system. The Republican calendar sought to reorganize time itself and allow for a new understanding of it by replacing the 62nd minute, 60 minute hour, 24 hour day and seven day week with a decimal numerical system that grouped 100 seconds per minute, 100 minutes per hour, and a 10 hour day into 10 day decades. We see this new hourly structure in the dial that Liberty supports with her right hand at the top center with the indication of 10 hours and 50 minutes. And the minute hand therefore goes around twice in the span of an hour. Below this, the older woman gestures to the bottom center dial, uh, which shows old time. According to the Committee of Public Instruction's initial report to the convention, the new calendar, quote, offered to the world a new tool with which to inscribe the annals of, French, of the French nation. The persistence of multiple numbering systems in the limited extant watch faces that survive suggests that this system, while ideologically powerful, was as confusing to 18th century individuals as it is to us today. The mode of timekeeping on the hourly and daily level was utilized only for 17 months. And here I show you just a selection of some of these, uh, these with a potpourri of revolutionary emblems, um, but not one that I have encountered shows revolutionary time without, as it were, a reference dial for translation. On the other hand, the utilization of decades organized into renamed months and the 10 leftover days that became feast days remained in use from 1794 until 1806. In the words of the creator of the Republican calendar, Charles Guilberon, the calendar sought to, quote, open a new book of history, end quote, indicative of the widespread understanding among revolutionaries and reactionaries alike that their contemporary moment was then and was to become historically significant. And Matthew Shaw and Sanja Perovic's work on the calendar has been so important to our understanding of the project and the ways in which new time and collective memory are inextricably linked. The starting point, the zero zero coordinate, if you will, of this new history was far from fixed. In journals and pamphlets from 1789, we first read the designation of the first year of liberty, initially without a fixed starting point. The following year, the storming of the Bastille in 1789 was retroactively recognized as the first event of a new timeline, but this would shift multiple times, creating anxiety and urgency about the calendar's implementation that is palpable in the archives. When in November of 1793, the full program of the new calendar was implemented, it began its count with September 22nd, 1792, the date of the Declaration of the Republic that corresponded with the autumnal equinox. Amid all of these revisions, literally changing conceptions of history as both cyclical and linear had to be reconciled alongside an explicit indoctrination of a restart narrative. It is perhaps best exemplified by the fact that 1793, the year of the calendar's implementation, was both the start of a new history and simultaneously part of a continuity. It marked year two of liberty. Notably, this means that year one of liberty was only demarcated in hindsight. It had not been lived as such, it existed only as part of history. And indeed, to my knowledge, there are no artworks or documents signed year one. Although if anyone here can think of any examples, I would love to know. Prints such as this hand-colored perpetual calendar put that, on, uh, put that instability on display with movable parts and tables that allow its users to toggle between the new style and the old style. And on, in the bottom uh, on the right, you see uh, old style and on the left, new style. And I hope you can see my cursor, but these are actually um, uh, like insert card as we have on greeting cards, sort of inserts that you can move uh, up and down to, to adjust. And they are tied um, in to the, the, the revised months. Um, and same here with the years. 
Um, and I direct you all to Richard Todd's excellent work on the provisionality of revolutionary era ephemera um, to learn more about objects like these. In defining his term chronotype, the Russian philosopher and literary theorist Mikhail Bakin noted that, quote, time thickens, takes on flesh, becomes artistically visible. Likewise, space becomes charged and responsive to the movements of time, plot, and history, end quote. Similarly, in the material and visual culture of the revolution, one sees the real and material importance of time and timeliness, in rep the representations that work to codify revolutionary history. Artistic choice of subject and style had to reconcile not only with a nascent historical consciousness, but also with the period's pervasive temporal contingencies. From conception to execution, from production to consumption, and sometimes from abandonment to destruction, willful or accidental, artists involved in the high stakes navigation of the revolution's social political tides had to negotiate with time, old and new. The revolution was characterized by abandoned projects, municipal initiatives, short-lived political clubs and journals, and private ambitions. The revolution itself appeared to be accomplished uh, at several junctures, only for the collective realization that further change was needed. For example, on September 29th, 1791, Maximilien Robespierre declared at the National Assembly, quote, the revolution is completed, end quote. Several months later, the deputy and author uh, Jean-Paul Robat de Saint-Étienne published an almanac for the year 1792, suggesting the completion of the revolution. The inscription reads, quote, the history of these three memorable years presents us with a dramatic scene that has had its beginning, its middle, and its end, end quote. Rabot de Saint-Étienne was guillotined in December of 1793, and Robespierre was executed in July of 1794, neither seeing the end of the revolution. One can trace three declarations of rights and four constitutions in just over 10 years, as incompletion became a defining characteristic of life under the revolution, the arts and particularly large scale projects were no exception. Jacques-Louis David's The Oath of the Tennis Court, which I can assure you was never completed, offers an instructive example. When on June 20th, 1789, the representatives of the third estate gathered in the tennis court at Versailles, and took their oath to remain in assembly until a constitution was drafted. It marked one of the first times that citizens openly opposed the monarchy. Within a week, the third estate had the support of representatives of the clergy, the second estate, uh, and 47 liberal nobles who made up the first estate, signaling a fundamental change in the form of government. Nevertheless, the oath takers of 1789 we're not seeking to overthrow the monarchy, but to reform it. Such limited ambitions would shortly seem misguided and insufficient, as suggested by an anonymous critic's 1791 reaction to this drawing. Quote, in David's composition, we believe we are witnessing and taking part in this immortal scene, which presaged the triumph of French liberty. The painting will be the history of our revolution although the subject seems circumscribed in the first period, end quote. Despite the artistic liberties taken by David to bring the 1789 bent up to date with 1791 rhetoric and values, viewers of the drawing could discern a fissure between the revolution as conceived in 1789 and 1791. The ongoing evolution of the notion of what the revolution project sorry, the revolutionary project actually was or should be, had dire implications for artists trying to enshrine it through representation on the grand scale. The event's significance became increasingly clear in the months that followed it, with various celebrations held to mark the event's first anniversary. It was around the time of these festivities that David began to conceive of a project representing the contemporary oath swearing. Issuing both allegory and the antiquarian impulse, David's composition claimed to focus on the contemporary event, but it was far from a direct transcription. 
On October 28, 1790, David's friend, the deputy Edmond Dubois Francais, proposed that the Jacobin Club, uh, a radical political club, commissioned David to create a large scale painting of the seminal event. In fact, David had already begun the composition, and the existence of a draft of Dubois Francais' speech in David's hand suggests that the former launched the art, sorry, that the former launched the project at the artist's instigation. Dubois Crancy declared that the point of the commission was twofold, to honor the assembly's planned new meeting, excuse me, to honor the assembly, uh, the national assembly, and to inspire patriotic fervor. He suggested that the canvas could decorate the assembly's new planned meeting space, thereby serving as a virtuous example and a reminder of that body's foundational act. Shortly thereafter, the National Assembly received proposals for this new space, one of which you see, as you see here, deftly included David's highly anticipated massive mural. And you see it here at center and the key tells us that it's the oath of the tennis court, um, but it was never built. Almost as soon as David accepted the commission, it became clear that his painting would be a fiction. One writer recounts that immediately following David's acceptance of the commission, a priest claimed his right to be included in the painting, despite his absence at the event of June 20th. Among the first of the clergy to join the third estate, the Abbe Dion had a duty on that day to guard the clerical archives and was thus forced to miss the main event. Seen as legitimate, the Abbe's claim opened the floodgates from from, for requests from others who were not actually present at the tennis court on June 20th, but who felt themselves to have been in, have been there in spirit. Someone suggested, quote, the painter could represent from a distance those whose spirit burned and was full of desire to be among those who took the oath, end quote. These were just several of the many requests and suggestions offered to David. The artist returned to the tribunal to declare that while he was grateful and accepted all of these observations, he asked that the assembly consider that historical veracity and unity were, ne were necessary for the painting. The response was unanimously applauded. What the German observer witnessed was the negotiation played out in real time of history being re rewritten, of the tension between reality and intention and between documentation and creation. The very ideas that David called upon when asking for leeway, historical veracity and unity, were themselves at odds with one another. The artist faced a challenge in attempting to reconcile competing interests and investments in his depiction of the foundational event. This was heightened by a budding understanding that David's representation would not serve as a mere factual recording of the day, but indeed would become history by entering into the communal consciousness. Uh, sorry, by entering into the communal consciousness, as Michel Foucault would suggest that truth is inherently linked to and beholden to power, a, a relationship that itself is historically contingent. Thus, it was indispensable that David's representation be invested with the authority uh, by the increasingly important governing body of the National Assembly. The artist might already have begun the conceptual creative undertaking, but he understood that it was imperative that the work be commissioned. This was not merely a question of finances or prestige, although these were contributing considerations. The National Assembly's commission, unanimous no less, bestowed power on David's representation. The condition of patronage inherently legitimized David's work even before he began it and therefore raised the stakes of his depiction. In its negotiation of fact and aspirational fiction, David's project might productively be considered alongside our own period's notion of truthiness, albeit taken out of the satirical context through which it entered contemporary consciousness, or what art historian Linda Nochlin has termed, quote, circumstantial accuracy, end quote. Deftly navigating the tensions between intention and fact, David avoided being beholden either to accurate details or to the regrets of his compatriots who like him uh, had not been present 
David, David's project was to create not a realistic representation of June 20th, 1789, but one that felt true to his contemporaries in 1791 when the drawing was displayed to the public. In order to achieve this, his depiction had to reflect contemporary values and realities, imbued with the knowledge of the month since the event, while also including details that would assert its claim of truthfulness. The goal was not to create a hybrid representation, but a fiction that passed as, and subsequently became, truth. David's composition inserted the heroes of 1791 into the 1789 subject. For example, the revolutionary journalist Jean-Paul Marat can be seen in the upper right balcony uh, in the top hat with his back towards us, recording the event for his magazine, L'Ami du Peuple, The Friend of the People. Although that publication had not existed in 1789 and Marat was not present uh, at the oath. There are many such incongruities in the drawing, which I have explored elsewhere. David chose to display the drawing in 1791, first in his studio, which he opened up for visitors, and then in the salon exhibition, only the second and the last uh, instance in which David ever exhibited a drawing. He did so to garner interest uh, in the project in order to raise money through donations, uh, need to raise the money uh, needed to fund the large scale painting. Despite the praise garnered by the drawing, continuing the project became co a complicated undertaking. Uh, several of the prota featured protagonists had fallen out of favor. Mirabeau had been posthumously disgraced. dubois crancy abandoned politics. And Bailly, the figure at the center, was increasingly seen as a counter-revolutionary. These changing pol political tides posed a problem for the relevance of David's subject matter. But the event itself, if not its central players, was seen as having enduring value. Ultimately, it was decided that it should be funded as a national monument, although this too proved aspirational. Scholars posit that David abandoned the project as early as 1792, but the story is a bit more complex, as in 1795 and as late as 1797, there are exchanges about David completing it. I think we can only say for certain that David stopped all work on it when in 1803, the canvas was rolled up and transported to the Louvre for storage. In this longer durée of the painting's history, one sees a disjunction between the two scales of the artwork, what Stuart Sherman has identified as, quote, the temporality of the artwork and the temporality of the process that produced it, end quote. The questions of temporality the question of temporality is evident in the materiality of the painted fragment as well. The remarkable fragment reveals that David did not follow the standard academic practice of transferring the fully worked up composition from a drawing to, a, to the canvas, but he essentially began working through the composition anew. As with his first elaboration of the composition, David began with nude figures, carefully articulating the anatomy of his figures in their poses. In the drawing of the Oath of the Tennis Court, some anatomical features are visible. Uh, these evidence David's working method, and indeed that of most history painters trained in the academy, where drawing of nude figures uh, was paramount. Clothing them came as a second step of the process. Similarly, here on the canvas, David began with nude bodies drawn in a powdery white chalk medium that he then outlined with a gray wash and brush. The white chalk was used precisely for its friability, which when covered with wash and subsequently with oil paint would disappear, leaving no trace of this preliminary process. However, the picture's unrealized status allows David's process to be fully on display in a way that the artist never anticipated or intended. Much of the white chalk has dissipated over time and with successive rolling and unrolling of the canvas. What remains are outlines of the figures, such as that of Bailly here in the center. I hope you can see it. Um, where the canvas, uh, the outlines, uh, where the canvas, which was previously protected by the chalk medium, 
has not faded or accumulated grime in the same way as the areas exposed to, uh, sorry, as the exposed areas of light gray preparatory layer of the majority of the canvas. This material history often creates ghostly impressions. In an example of the seated figure of Emmanuel Saez, whose head was first uh, outlined in white chalk and then angled differently and gone over in gray wash applied with a brush, you can see uh, the process creating a sense of proto stop gap animation as though the figure was shifting ever so slightly in his seat. A similar process was repeated for the clothing that was applied on top of the nude figures. The resulting ghostliness of the interplay of David's present and erased chalk marks and brush strokes, however inadvertent, evokes a sense of the shifting fortunes of the revolutionary's protagonists, including David, as well as of his unrealized magnum opus. As the revolution progressed, how an event was represented became equally important to the selection of the subject itself. Dispassionate representation, even or perhaps particularly at the grand scale, was seen as dishonest, as Jacques Berthaud encountered in the widespread criticism of his 1793 painting of the storming of the Tuileries Palace that took place on August 10th, 1792. In the wake of the Girardon reaction, including the assassination of the revolutionary journalist Marat, commentary focused on the juxtaposition between the specificity of this painting and the pervasive collective memory of the day. One critic wrote, everyone who bore witness to this event will agree with us that there was never an action where there was more confusion or tumult. Nevertheless, the artist puts forward with the coolness of a deliberate movement. The combatants arranged in platoons. One feels no enthusiasm. The author retained neatness and care in the brushwork. We advise him to use it in subjects in which these qualities are not false." End quote. In alignment with revolutionary rhetoric that condemned duplicity and championed forthrightness, the erasure of the presence and individuality of the artist became a liability. It is in this context that one should reconsider artworks from the period that display a looser sketch-like handling, such as Marat at His Last Breath, which is probably David's best known painting from the revolutionary era. In it, scumbled background, the scumbled background creates a sense of eth ethereality and ephemerality, underscoring Marat's transition between life and death, between revolutionary hero and revolutionary martyr. In examining David's revolutionary era paintings, a pronounced stylistic trend emerges. From the earliest days of the revolution, David had explored a distinct form of paint handling characterized by its open scumbles, dry brush application, thinned paint, and the use of colored grounds left visible. For the sake of time, I'll show you just two uh, today, including this marvelous energetic, marvelously energetic and intense self-portrait uh, now in the collection of the Uffizi, and a portrait of Madame Trudin in the collection of the Louvre. Uh, previous, previously positioned as aborted projects, new archival evidence and the existence of copies that explicitly replicate David's froti style and at times attribute it to him, suggest both access to the original paintings as well as other artists' interest in the aesthetic. I posit that David was experimenting with the pictorial pictorial language that connoted the urgency, immediacy, earnestness, and changeability of the moment. What I call an aesthetic of contingency was a studied effect akin to rhetorical device that allows an orator to render his message more impactfully. And I should say that I'm sticking to David's oeuvre for today uh, for the sake of cohesion of this presentation, but there's a whole corpus of works dated uh, from 1790 to 1794 that usually utilize this sketch-like aesthetic by artists closely connected to David, as well as those further removed from his orbit. Um, and this larger corpus um, comes together to reveal 
The shared moments uh, of friction, disjunction, and artistic adaptation necessitated by the disruptive events of the revolution. Across these works, the perceived stylistic irresolution of these paintings engages the viewer's imagination in a mode derived from the French theoretician Roger de Pille and allow for a more personal projection onto the depicted scene. This vital function of the viewer as creator of meaning afforded artists and their paintings a certain malleability that was essential for navigating the political variables of the revolution. In bringing his technique to the important public commission of the death, the last breath of Jean-Paul Marat and the subsequent, uh, the death of Joseph Barat, David deployed uh, his experimentations to powerful effects. In the bara, a nude youthful body stretches out uncomfortably against an almost monochromatic background. The dissolving ground line and the suggestion of trees qua clouds that billow in the top third of the canvas connotes an ambiguous outdoor setting. The boy occupies a liminal space between life and death. His torso is heavy and corpse-like. The weightiness of his stacked, disjointed legs contrasts starkly with the delineated musculature of his chest and neck, which are still imbued with the energy that keeps his head from flopping downwards, as one might expect of a lifeless body. The muscles of the arms and hands, too, remain activated as the boy clutches a revolutionary cockade and a letter. This gesture is intentional and emotive, David deliberately renders the boy as bringing these attributes up to his chest rather than falling upon them. Revolutionary fervor, not gravity, is the dominant force here. The painting's porous quality, the painting has a porous quality, but still includes fine finishing details, such as the touches of red dab added to the interior of the nostrils or the corners of the eyes. There is a carefully calculated balance between the amount of paint matter in the figure and the relative dearth of media in the subject matter. Excuse me. Uh, there's carefully calculated balance between the amount of paint matter in the figure and the relative dearth of media in the background of the bara. In its subject matter, its materiality and its history, the death of Joseph Bara offers insights into the precarious conditions of image making during the French Revolution. On December 7th, 1793, the 13-year-old Joseph Barra was killed by royalists in the Vendée while holding his commanding general's horses. Accosted by the enemy, that is to say royalists, the boy was told to cry, vive le roi, long live the king, to save his life. But instead he shouted, vive la république, for which he was killed. An account of his bravery was immediately absorbed into the Jacobin propaganda machine as a demonstration of virtue, courage, filial duty, and devotion to his country. And it was particularly championed by Robespierre. The story of Barra and of another child martyr, uh, Agricole Viala, were added to the catalog of individual heroism and disseminated in all sorts of prints. And not only prints, um, but I'm showing you two examples here. They were honored by having their ashes inducted into the Pantheon alongside other revolutionary martyrs. Choreographed by David, that Pantheonization ceremony, which is the subject of an article I'm now completing, included directives for a painted parade banner representing the child martyr. David's use of an aesthetic of unfinishedness is therefore even more appropriate given this painting's transitory function. Notably, the uneven shadows of the feet, often considered a moment of clumsiness by scholars, might have read as a sort of rigor mortis, a twitch that would have been emphasized by the canvas when it was in motion. Scholarship has often emphasized that the myth of the child martyr was intimately tied to Robespierre in fundamental ways. So as plans for the pantheonization ceremony, ceremony were necessarily abandoned upon Robespierre's fall. While this is true, it attends little to questions of materiality and to questions of timing. The ceremony was planned for the 10th of Thermidor. If David anticipated his painting's public display on that day, 
then the paint would have needed several days to dry in advance of such a procession. Therefore, even if plans for the ceremony were scrapped following Robespierre's fall on the 9th of Thur Thermidor, we can rule out that it was that fall that preempted the painting's completion, in that David couldn't have abandoned the painting on the 9th of Thermidor if he anticipated showing it on the 10th. The painting might then be considered finished enough for both its ephemeral function as a commemorative banner and for its role in transmitting the image of a hero to posterity. David deployed an aesthetic of contingency to create an emblematic image that resists narrative specificity, focusing instead on the ideological potential of the scene. David's depiction takes up this story of local heroism, but strips it of the specifics to create an abstracted embodiment of virtue, one that synthesized individual and collective action. Neither somebody nor everybody, David's bara represents anybody, any French citizen's potential to be elevated from the unknown to the status of national hero, to the status of a symbol of France. Occupying a liminal space between finished and unfinished, between portraiture and history painting, between realism and allegory, Bara fundamentally embodies the problematics of painting history during the revolution. In its form and function, David's The Death of, Bar of Joseph Bara puts on display the temporal hybridity of artistic production during the French Revolution. But this history of experimentation and the particular temporal turmoil of the revolutionary context is all but erased through the codification of that period's history during the 19th century by initiatives like the Museum of French History at Versailles that transformed the Jeu de Pomme into the National Monument itself and therefore completed the messiness of the revolution. This continues in our present moment through Versailles' preservation of such constructions both physical and narrative. Close attention to the material culture of the revolution, though, can offer access to those obstructed stories, excuse me, to those obscured stories of the work of, of the artists in a search, in their search for a visual language that responded to the contingency of that moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. I'm going to let Bethany uh, Q&A, but I just wanted to to use my chair's privilege briefly to, to thank Daniela for perfect timing. I was about to cut you off, but I didn't have to. And for a really wonderful um, paper that rounded out our year of seminar talks with some thoughts on the challenges and complications of time. So thank you very much for your paper, Daniela. So if you want to raise your hand in the Zoom or put your question in the chat, we can get those going. All right, well then I'll use my host privilege because uh, apparently we're just gonna privilege ourselves over here. It's gonna be great. Uh, thank you again, Danielle, that was great. I am really struck by looking at that Joseph Farah painting uh, because I always think his arm is put, pulled out um, where it's actually the line of like where the ground and the, the hill or whatever is behind him. So it seems like he's pointing towards something. Um, and I'd wonder if you could talk a bit about how you came upon that work and like, I mean, it, like, that seems like a lot for these child martyrs to carry. Um, and if there are these like two, are there more that show up later or is it just these two or like, yeah. It's just these two. Let me see if I can figure out, I can put it back on the screen if I can figure out technology. Um, uh, yeah, so it's just these two martyrs. They uh, have this moment. Um, it's very much tied to Robespierre's rhetoric of, uh, of trying to uh, inculcate 
the French public with this idea uh, of um, of anybody having martyrdom potential and revolutionary potential. Um, and, uh, but they're just the two children, um, but they fall in a lineage of, of local heroism. Uh, this, which is, I argue is an, is a sort of genre that emerges during the revolution. Um, the national assembly, uh, and then the legislative assembly in its different iterations puts out pamphlets of subjects of local heroism, um, that, uh, that show off really sort of obscure and trite moments. Um, such oh, the one that makes me laugh always is um, a person uh, whose last name is Le Roi coming to his local municipal government and asking for a name change to not be associated with uh, with the monarchy anymore, right? Um, so, so really everything from a uh, a woman who sits on a barrel of gunpowder and threatens to blow up her children rather than give it to to uh, the opposition to sort of um, very symbolic gestures. Uh, and the there are several iterations of this um, recueil that are put forward uh, and that are shared uh, as both uh, didactic examples um, to be taught to school children in particular. Um, and also that are uh, used when the National Assembly launches an artistic competition for a national monument. And so um, when uh, in response to petitions by artists um, who are complaining that there's no patronage for the arts, the National Assembly decides to step in and launches an artistic competition, uh, the so-called uh, competition of year two. Um, they pretty explicitly indicate that that artists should feel free to draw on scenes uh, from this from this um, compilation of local heroic action. Not all the artists do. A lot of the artists opt to to depict um, sort of the major events of the revolution. Uh, but a lot, of, but a number of the artists submit compositions um, uh, based on on local heroism. So in that way. Bara sort of falls into the continuum of of that tradition, uh, but the child like the child nature, um, the the youthful nature here is is unique. Um, uh, well, unique in this in these two cases. Yeah. So uh, Bara and Bara, uh, uh, Bara and we, uh, Daniela, we have uh, a, a, a many questions now piling up in the chat. So. Uh, this is great. We have Michael who says that this is a, a superb account of contingency and ideology and the visual language of David and his contemporaries. I'm newly engaged with an oeuvre that never spoke to me as vividly in the past. Um, Eleanor has a question. Uh, the David painting of Bara's death is new to me and two things that strike me about it are A, the feminized hair and face of the young boy and B, the complete invisibility of any apparent wounds on his body. If this was meant to be a piece of propaganda to any, to any extent, what would those choices have meant, do you think? And we have yeah. a few more after this too, just so you okay. know. Okay, <laughs> so you're telling me to be brief, got it. Um, uh, yeah, I, so the feminization of his body uh, in general um, is, uh, is something that has been talked about quite a bit in the scholarship, um, that his uh, genitalia is sort of obscured or suppressed, and maybe he's androgynous. Um, and uh, and there are castration narratives that one can pull out of this if they would like to. I do not trend in that direction. For me, um, the uh, feminization and the youthful appearance so the youthful and androgynous appearance of the body, both of those aspects, um, and actually the suppression of sort of the mechanism of his death, if you will, uh, have to do with David um, creating an emblem. I don't think that David is trying to, I think he's moving away from the narrative specificity of the individual martyr and trying to create a type, right? Not unlike Bar uh, Mara, who... Um, uh, whose sort of uh, 
markers of his death are sort of around, even though the event itself isn't explicit. Here you have even fewer of those markers. Uh, and, and so I think he's stripping down and trying to create sort of an emblematic image that could function as, um, as sort of any man, right? Any, any, any French citizen. Um, uh, and I think that the nudity sort of contributes to that as well. Uh, we can't all be stabbed in bathtubs is what I hear you say. Uh, thank you. I, question from Kelsey in the chat. Thank you for such an illuminating paper. I'm fascinated by the pocket watches uh, with people keep putting questions in the chat so that things keep moving. Um, the pocket watches with which you began your talk and the idea of owning time, but also translating time from the old to the new. Can you share any more about these objects? Where did you find them? Are there any more examples? Where were they made? Who made them? Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. Um, I So uh, I chanced upon one of these objects in the Musée Carnavale. You did not see that one because they refused to take a photo of it for me. Um, and it's behind glass. But uh, they're, they're sort of peppered around. Um, and once you start looking for them, there's there are more dials than full objects that survive. Uh, and they, they're they mostly made in Paris, as far as I can tell, um, that it's very much sort of the locus of, of these, um, uh, of these discussions, um, and they're fairly short lived, right? They're not really necessary for, for long. It's only 17 months that, that the dual temporal aspect, uh, remains in effect, uh, and, and how much it's really ever adopted is a little unclear to me, honestly. Um, so I think it's it's more of a gesture. There are clock faces from before the adoption of the calendar that have uh, a normal clock face um, with revolutionary emblems and icons, right? So so it's interesting to me to trace that sort of this is definitely a phase of the revolution um, where where this is a priority and a concern. Um, the the archives are not great as to sort of the thought process behind the introduction of these clocks. Um, and, and in some cases we don't have the makers. There's a few, uh, where the maker's name is, is, um, inscribed on the clock face or the watch face, but I, it's not something I've delved very deeply into, um, to be totally honest. Um, and then there's another, yeah, there's a, a follow-up that I think to that from Betsy who says, thanks for an amazing talk. Uh, question, I wanted to better understand more about the new time calendar conventions the revolutionaries proposed. Was there some economic reason to change the approach or was it purely symbolic? I will add an editorial, or was it just we really loved base 10 because we are metricing everything? Uh, um, so unlike daylight savings time, there is no purported uh, economic incentive, uh, real or imagined, um, but it's a symbolic return to nature um, is, is sort of the central uh, uh, aspect of the, the revision of calendar. So in a way, sort of that base 10 is, is more natural, um, uh, more uniform uh, as well, but but the months are all renamed after um uh after you know it's it's like the month of the meadow the month of wind right of of natural phenomenon or locations tied to the seasons um and each day is instead of having a saint day uh is is inscribed with an uh a plant or an animal or a, a tool of harvesting. Um, so I don't remember what uh, today corresponds to, but I happen to have looked up that tomorrow corresponds to the day of the duck. Um, so depending on how you trend, delicious or, you know, quack quack or adorable, um, uh, because there are these fun initiatives where uh, people extend the revolutionary calendar into present day. Uh, and so you can continue to to sort of use the old style. Um, but in that, in that replacement of the days from saint days to agricultural days, um, I think is is another central sort of incentive of the of the calendar, which is to move away from ecclesiastical time. Um, so there's a way in which both ecclesiastical time and monarchical time um, are seen as two aspects that have to be removed from society. 
Uh, we have a comment in the chat from Judith who said, talking about economic consequences, that uh, it made a complete mess of the seven day market square sequence in rural areas because they moved to a five or 10 day rotation, which hurt provisioning schedules. Uh, so when you change calendars, y'all make, make thoughts about it. We have two more um, in the chat, but if anyone, does anyone wanna, has anyone you know got a, a question burning now that we have? Okay, no burning. I, I guess we shouldn't talk about revolution and burning at the same time, that's a bad move. Um, one is from Karen. Um, thanking you for this fascinating talk. Is there any criticism of the stylized immediacy of the Barat painting and the portrait of Madame Choudain? Um, did anyone call it as disingenuous? That's one question. It looks like you say no. That's a short answer. So they, so uh, a short answer. Um, they weren't displayed. Uh, so um, Barat's painting sort of uh, becomes irrelevant with the fall of Robespierre. David is in prison shortly thereafter because he uh, is, is a fan of Robespierre. Um, uh, and actually the pantheonization ceremony that he was choreographing was seen as potentially, was revisited as a potential military coup because um, these child soldiers had a military component in their pantheonization ceremony. Uh, and so David is accused and, and imprisoned. So nobody sees the bara uh, for a period of time. Um, uh, it and the Mara have an interesting afterlife where at some point um, David seems to paint over them with like an obscure paint to suppress the image. So they looked like maybe blank canvases um, uh, during a later phase. And it's only at the um, inventory of his posthumous sale that they're sort of re revised um, or or revealed. Uh, the Trudin similarly, so I, it is not publicly displayed um, and we have frustratingly little correspondence with the um, with the sitter or the family or whoever would have sort of where the commission would originate, um, which we have for for some of the other portraits that I've worked on. But we have a um, a painting after the Trudin, uh, that explicitly duplicates the froti and that um, is signed after David, right? It attributes that that aesthetic uh, replication to David um, too. So it was it circulated somehow, but I but I don't know how. Uh, last question from Elaine: Can you talk I, I, about any? Yeah, oh, I can go I'll on. Pop in. Please, uh, because we are officially out of time. So I, I want to give Danielle the opportunity to not answer the question. Um, uh, but if she can stay for a minute, I was wondering if you could connect the beginning and end of your paper and think about the revolution's kind of triumph over immutable forces like time and gravity uh, and, and the way that the symbols of the revolution kind of transcend all of that. Yeah, um, I'm I'm happy to stay and answer it, but also happy to have people pop off if they they need to. Um, I uh, I don't know that the revolution does transcend time. I don't know that the revolution comes out as a victor here, and I think about that in the context of the way that the narratives about the revolution circulate in the 19th century, and the way that the revolution as such is used and repurposed by very different factions throughout the 19th century. And I would say to, probably to this day, um, sort of redefining the goals and the centers, central tenets of, of the, um, the different ideologies uh, to serve different needs. Um, and so I, that's, and I, I sort of, I see that in the fact that, you know, and not to to rag on Versailles, but you know you can't see the drawing. It's very hard to see the drawing. You can't see the painted fragment um, unless you pay on for a specific tour that happens once a month, um, and you wouldn't know that that's what you were going to get to see on that tour. Uh, but you can go into the Jeu de Pomme with this nineteenth century uh, codification um, that's illustrated everywhere. Uh, I see that as sort of a an expropriation of the revolution's actual tenants into sort of subsequent uh, um, 
politically charged, socially charged sort of initiatives. Uh, so in a way, I don't think that the revolution triumphs over time. I think time gets the better of the revolution. <laughs> a depressing note perhaps to end on. And speaking of time, I think we're out of it. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Um, Danielle, would you be willing to follow up? There are, there, Judith Miller had one last question in the chat. Would you be uh, to, to follow up with her afterwards? Of um, course. Um, she just says she'd love to connect. So, yeah, I'm happy to um, drop my email in the chat. That she already be... has it. Oh. I gave it to her already, Danielle. You're cool. Okay, never mind. Then I don't have to multitask. <laughs> Well, thank you, Daniela, for ending our, our season on such a wonderful note. Thank you, everyone, for coming out uh, and, and, and supporting Odd Sex. And please do look out for our amazing slate of speakers that we have next year. But until then, enjoy your summers, uh, whatever time may uh, give you. And uh, election in the UK, seven weeks time. Woohoo! Tories out. It's just been announced during Danielle's paper. Revolution is coming. <laughs> Hopefully this time to get the better of time. Well, I just thought so the 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 way that the David with the bara that that the you know we're not gonna fall on things, we're gonna lift the you know, lift the cockade up and then thinking about the the all the the clocks trying to impose a new form of time over things that should be linear but or should be you know gravitational and that pull just doesn't has no power in art but not so much as you say in reality yeah yeah I think it's it's something almost that artists we can well I don't know that we can I think the art leaves us the traces of that that yeah. wrestling in a way that we otherwise lose um well, it's so fascinating. It's, it's I love odd sex because I learn about all sorts of things I would otherwise never encounter. And this was an absolute delight. So thank you very much. Bethany, thank you for suggesting and hosting. Um, sure. Should we stop recording? We yeah, should stop yeah, recording. Yeah. It's all right. I'll, yeah. I'll make you cut it off later.